welcome. So welcome. Also, everyone who's watching it on YouTube or on Moodle, welcome back. Um, I'm hoping that the quality is good enough. Um, I've been dropping some massive frames, but uh, we'll just continue and see uh, see how it works out. So I'm hoping that it will be okay. It's not too bad for you guys. So common idioms. Common idioms are things which I use over and over and over again, which every time when I write code, I see... A problem and for this problem I have a kind of default solution. It's kind of a, a, a an algorithm in a way. So a standard little algorithm for standard little things. Um, so some snippets I use again and again um, are snippets like this. So one of the things that is a major pitfall when you are programming in R is the factor um, messing up. So when you want to go from a factor variable into a numeric variable, you have to go via the character because otherwise it will renumber or relabel your uh, factor levels. Um, and as a little example here, I have uh, three or four values, right? I have the value five, 10, 11, and five. They are coded as characters. And now when I make a factor as it, uh, when I, force them to be a factor variable, what happens is, is that internally R starts recoding them. So R just orders them and starts recoding them to save memory for the factor variable, because it knows that a factor can be mentioned like 100 times or 200 times. Um, so instead of every time writing down the exact factor value, it just internally couples a number to each entry um, that is in the factor. The problem comes in when I do an as numeric on it, right? When I do an as numeric on a factor, even though the factor has the levels 5, 10, 11, and 5, the as numeric of this factor will produce 3, 1, 2, and 3. So the 5 is coded internally as a 3, the 10 is in internally coded as a 1, and 11 is internally coded as a 2. If I want to get the real numerical value, so the numerical representation of the class, of the factor class, I have to go via the S character. So I take the factor, I transform them, or I, I force them to be characters, and then I force them to be numeric. And now I get the original values back. So this is something that goes wrong a lot of the time in R where you are doing an S factor and you then do an S numeric on it. And in the end, it kind of destroys the data that is in the factor levels. Um, and you always have to go via character. So in the back of your mind, every time that you need to go from a factor variable to a numeric variable, make sure that you first go via character. And this is just useful advice. And a lot of code that I write has this as numeric as fact, uh, as numeric as character, and then a factor as input, just to prevent it relabeling them as three, one, two, and three um, internally. Some other idioms: um, creating an empty list. Um, it, I do this a lot when I have a for loop, right? And I calculate different things, and I want to store all of these things in a list. Um, so, for example, I'm going through the rows of the matrix, and for each row, I calculate three or four values, which I then want to return in a list. Um, if I want to make an empty list, then for some weird reason, you have to use the vector function. So the function is not called list, the function is called vector. Then you have to specify that you want to have a list, and then the amount of space in your list. So, for example, five spaces. If you want to remove a single column from a matrix, I generally do it like this. So if I have a matrix called M matrix, um, then of course I take all the rows, right? So just comma, taking all the rows, and then I do minus, which the call names of matrix is, is some column, right? So I, I generally like removing columns by their name and not by their number. Hey, of course I could have just written minus seven, and then it, throw, it throws away column number seven. Um, but if you do it like this, it takes you a lot more typing. But the advantage of it is that when you get a new data set and the order of the columns have changed, then it will automatically or it will still throw away the column with the name some column. 
So it prevents or it makes your code more future-proof. Um, so if you get a new version of a data set, um, then just using this kind of a way of removing columns um, will mean that you always remove the correct column yeah, because often I get a data set two or three times and every time that I get the data set, people added a column or they remove the column. And then of course, throwing away column seven might not throw away the column that I intended to throw away. If you wanna remove multiple columns, you can do the exact same structure, but now you, instead of using is is, you use the in function, right? So you say which call names of matrix are in the matrix are in the columns that I want to remove. So for example, column A, B, and C. Um, and then I just say minus which, so I remove those from my matrix. You can use the same strategy also for rows, um, but the idea behind it is, is that you, you want to use the row names and the column names in R because a matrix can have row names and it can have column names. And these are very useful um, to remove things by column name or by row name um, because there's no chance of a new data set, two additional columns, and now I'm removing the wrong column in the whole analysis. So it just future proofs your code to be explicit, say, no, I want to remove the row names of the matrix, which are in these row names, and then throw them away. So um, just do minus which. And this makes your code a lot clearer. Um, instead of just saying minus uh, one, five, and 13, um, no one knows exactly what is happening. But here, when you say, no, take the row names, look up these, and then remove them, um, that is much clearer. So it just makes your code future-proof. It looks good. A lot of the times when people make uh, tables or columns, they do this in Excel. And often when we make tables for publication, you want to have a certain format that you are using. So for example, you want to write everything in scientific format and you want to always have like a, a uh, times 10 to the power of minus two there, right? Because some are 10 to the minus five, others are 10 to the minus seven. Um, but if you have 0 0.01, uh, you don't want it to be written 0 0.013 um, because you want to have the same structure in the whole column. Uh, then you can use the format function to force numbers into a certain formatting. So here we say, take this number, write it down in scientific format and make sure that you always mention three digits. So it's 1.35 times 10 to the minus two. Um, and this will just force the whole column to use the scientific layout. Um, you don't have to use it with a single number. You can also input a, a list of numbers or a, a vector of numbers. Uh, you can also do it the other way around, right? If I have 1.35 times 10 to the minus 11, and I want to write it out with all of the zeros in front of it, then of course I can just say, uh, turn off scientific mode and just do the format. Of course, the number of digits are now specifying the number of digits that it takes from um, the original input and not the, it, it doesn't stop after two digits behind the column. But the format function allows you to go from one format, so from like scientific formatting of numbers to more or less non-scientific formatting where you just list all of the zeros in front. Um, so just a useful tip, the format function is there. Um, it has more options as well. Um, so you can just check it out um, using question mark format in R and then you get the help file. And it shows you all kinds of different formattings that you can do. Um, but it's generally very useful to, uh, to be able to go from one format to the other. Some other common idioms that I use a lot is using string split with L apply. So, and this is something that we will see a lot also next week during the fishy data analysis, because um, I like chopping up things in little pieces and then selecting from these little pieces, right? So for example, imagine that I have a vector which has three dates in there, right? So it's the 3rd of January, 2020, the 1st of, March uh, 1995, and then the 20th of January. Oh, so the, they're the other way around. They're month, day, year. What I can do is I can then use this format and say, well, if I have these numbers, right, split them based on the minus symbol. So what this does, it, it goes through the whole vector, and for every vector, for every element in the vector, it splits it um, into, in this case, three 
loose parts. If I then want to get, for example, the year part, I can use the unlist function. And the unlist function takes this special function, right? Because unlist first takes, uh, or uh, if you use the lapply function on the thing that I just split, right? The lapply function has a special function that you can use, which is this select from function. So it's kind of the, the square bracket, uh, which you normally use to select from a matrix. So what I'm saying here is, is apply to every element that I just split it, right? Because I split it three elements or I split three elements um, from a vector into three elements each, but apply to the splitted values to select from and then take the third element. So this will take 2020, 1995 and 1973. So the years, and then I can use the unlist function to get rid of the fact that it is a list. But this is a very common idiom where um, you're you're chopping up characters or a list of characters into loose substrings um, or to uh, to split them by other things, and then you want to select from these from this list every time the third element from the list. We can also get the months by just saying, well, to the splitted values, select from and then take the first element every time, which will give us 0, 3, 0, 1, 0, 1. We can also use um, Greppel. So um, Grep logical is a way to do partial string matching. So if I want to see if the string 20 occurs into any of these um, strings, right, then I can do Greppel 20 as vector. And Greppel will say, well, true for the first one, because we see 20 here. For the second one, it will say false, because there is no 20. But for the third one, it will say true again. Why? Because the day here is 20. So it will, it will match to zero to the string. And if it occurs, it will return true. If it doesn't occur, it will return false. Um, if we don't want to have a true false vector, um, then we can, of course, say which. And then it will say 1,3 because the first element contains 20 and the third element also contains 20. You can also directly use the grep function. So the grep is um, the same, but it's just the which greppel. Um, so it's just a convenience function. Uh, greppel is just a logical vector. So it tells you true, false, true. Um, and grep will just tell you one and three. So it is the exact same thing. Instead of using which greppel, you can directly use grep um, and it will be the same answer. So it's uh, just a way of, of asking the question, is this number or is this sequence of characters anywhere in this um, list of things that we are looking at? Um, so the grep function, really useful when you want to do subsets or when people are very smart and they try to encode things into column names or in row names, which you should actually never do. But if, if you Sometimes people do, right? We we used, for example, the mouse ID underscore HT for hypothalamus, mouse ID underscore GF for gonadal fat. Um, so then you could use the grep function with HT to see which of these kind of combined IDs are measured on hypothalamus. Uh, so the grep function is really, really useful when you want to do string matching, uh, when you want to see if one string partially occurs or uh, if part of this, this string contains the letters that you are looking for. To combine this a little bit, this is more or less the function that I use a lot when I want to go to seasons. Um, and that is because in linear modeling, you often want to control for seasons and not so much for months, right? Because there's no real difference between January and February. Um, but spring might be very different from summer. Um, so have, if you're on the Northern Hemisphere, then this is the way that spring, summer, fall, and winter are coded. Um, so the thing is that my two season function is a function which has a single parameter as input, which is called X, which is the vector of dates that is being inputted. And then it has POS and POS is where are the uh, uh, the months, right? Because I need to know if the months, if it's month, year, day, or if it's day, month, year. I just went offline. That is strange. That is strange.
Let me see. Yeah, no, connection dropped completely. Frames missed due to rendering lag. Dat is, dat is zo annoying. Ja, ik heb ook totaal geen internet. Oh, ik ben op Zikko opeens. All right. Am I still here? No. Help, no. Twitch. Can people still hear me? No. Um. All right, start streaming, connecting. I'm back or not? Now I hear myself. Anyone in chat, am I still here? Yes. Oh, good. Yay. I had some internet issues. It just said, oh, massive drop of frames, reconnecting, reconnecting. Okay, good. I'm still there. Good, good, good. All right. Uh, yeah, so let's just continue. So this is the way that I, oh, now I'm watching myself, which is also a little bit weird, and I'm listening to myself as well. Uh, so and the way that I go from, from seasons to months, uh, or from months to seasons, is just having this function, which will just take a list or a vector of dates, um, and then I will tell it that position one, position two is, because I can have day, month, year, or month, day, year. Um, and then I can just specify on which position the months are in the in the vector. Um, and the way that I do it is just say, well, hey, use this string split, L apply, select from the position. So take the first, the second, or the third, um, and then unlist them and then make them numeric. Because when I have numeric months, I can compare them. Um, and what I do is I, I first make a empty return element. So I say, return is a repeat of the NA for as many months that I have, so the length of months. So if I have three input items, it will return three output items. Um, and then I say, well, when the month is larger than three or smaller than five, then it's spring, and the same for all the other ones. And I use this a lot because often in linear modeling, you want to include uh, the season um, because that is the thing that has an effect. The, the effect is not being born in January or being born in February. No, there's generally for mice or plants, there's a big difference if they are planted in spring or if they are planted in the fall or in, in the winter. Um, so and generally you, you don't want to put in 12 factors, 12 months as factor, but you want to input four seasons as a factor. It also gives you more statistical power because in, instead of calculating 11 betas for each month, so relative to January, you're now just calculating three betas relative to spring. Um, so it gives you more statistical power as well to use seasons instead of using months. If you want to calculate with dates and you don't want to do string splitting, there's also this as date function in R. So that will do kind of the conversion for you. Um, you just give it a single string which has a date encoded in it and then you can specify the format saying that well i have months i have days and then i have years and the year uh, here is capitalized meaning that it uses the long format for a year because you could also just write 070920 um, and then you would have used year with a small letter so then you would have used small uh, a small y 
Um, if you have two date objects, you can now do mathematics with them. So you can just subtract them from each other. And then it will tell you the amount of days between the two different dates that were passed. And of course, you can also then say, well, how many months or years are between two days? So um, you can convert dates to real date objects. So R internally also has a date structure, um, which is different from a character or a factor. Um, and if you use as date, it also allows you to make nicer plots because it knows that you have different dates. So instead of using one, two, three, four and plot them all behind each other, it can kind of do a time scale on the X axis when the X axis uh, or the values of the X axis specified are date values, uh, then it will use the date and it will calculate the distance between the dates properly instead of just saying, well, one, two, three, four, five, and just putting the points like that. Dates also work with the sec function. So I can also say um, have today, which I can get by sys.date. Uh, sys um, so here I get the current date from the R system. Um, and then I can make a sequence from today. Um, length out is 10. So, so go 10 steps from today um, and every time step by one week. So then it will give you the date. So it will tell you today is the 8th of July. Um, next week is the 15th of July, and then the week afterwards is the 22nd of July. So hey, it will, it will, it, you can make your own sequences. Um, for example, if you have measured mice or if you have measured plants on certain dates of the year, or if you're going to do measurements every week. You can also substitute and replace. Um, this is done by the G sub function. So imagine that you have a vector which is the quick brown fox. A fox can be smarter than a wolf and the early bird catches the worms and the early fox gets the bird. Um, we can just say uh, G sub fox by cat. And now what it will do, it will take each of these um, strings in the, in the vector and it will replace every occurrence of fox by the word cat. So G sub, very powerful tool to do global substitutions. So saying that, well, instead of having fox written, we want to have cat written. So a very, very common to do um, to kind of quickly modify um, your input data. And I used it also in the fishy data set um, because there, for example, in some years they coded some fish species using the uh, SSET. Um, and in some other years, it was just written down with uh, SS. Right, so then you can say uh, G sub SS by uh, uh, S set or G sub S set by SS. So to just make sure that it's consistent between the different years and the different measurements that they've done. So very powerful tool, G sub. Um, and you can also do matching. So you can say only replace Fox when it is at the beginning of the sentence or when it is at the end of the sentence. Um, and you can specify that as well using like these um, additional, uh, additional characters. If you want to order a matrix, which is something that happens a lot, you can use the order function. So the order function takes for example, if I want to order my matrix by the column, sum column, I can just say order my matrix, sum column, and then it tells me the ordering. And then I can use the ordering as the index to the rows, right? Because I'm sorting one column, which means that I get a new um, order for each of the rows. And then I can use the returned ordering to order my matrix in ascending or descending. Um, and you can specify that in the order function. So the order function has an additional parameter called um, by, and you can set by to being ascending or descending, and then it will sort them in the order that you want. Another very common idiom, which we use a lot, is going through a matrix and collect multiple statistics, right? For example, I want to know for each row, what is the mean and what is the standard deviation? The way to do this, and we've seen this already a couple of times, is to first create an empty variable which will hold the results. So I'm saying results is an empty variable. What am I going to do? Well, for x in one to the number of rows of the matrix, so I'm just going to go and have a new variable called x. First time it's one for the first row, second time it's, sec it's two for the second row. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to calculate two things, right? So the mean and the standard deviation using the mean and the standard deviation function. And then 
I'm going to say, well, the results that I have are now a row bind because I bind a new row to the results. And the row that I want to bind is the mean and the standard deviation. So I'm just going to combine mean and standard deviation together from being two separate values into one vector, which has a length of two. And then I'm going to bind this vector to my results. So now, of course, the results will be in the exact same order as the rows of my matrix. Um, and have for the first row, on the first row of results, I will have the mean and the standard deviation that I can use. So very common strategy, before you do anything, make an empty variable, then do the for loop I want to do for every row of the matrix, so for x in one to the number of rows of the matrix, compute the things that you want to compute, then combine them together using the C function, and then use the row bind to remember that these two values were computed for row number one, for row number two. Another very common um, um, idiom is I have a data frame and I want to do linear regression. And the issue is, is that this data frame, some of the columns are characters, some columns are numeric values, and some columns are factors. So what if I want to make sure that they are numeric? Well, what I always kind of do when I have a, a data frame in which some of the columns might be numeric, some other columns might not be numeric. Um, I always use this system where I say, well, take the columns that I want, one through five, for example, or one, two, six, and 12, take them from my matrix, and then to the columns, apply a function which just takes this column as an input, right? And again, I'm doing the same thing because I want to prevent going to a factor. So yeah, because if it would transform my numeric values to a factor by accident, it will mess up. So what I say is as numeric as character X. And now what it does, it takes the, the column out of the matrix. It looks at a single column of, the, for example, the first one. It converts all of the values in this column from what they are, be it factor, be it date, be it whatever, type logical it first goes to a character and then it goes to a numeric and this is just to prevent yourself from falling into errors um, where you directly call as numeric on a factor variable so always when you want to go through num uh, to numeric make sure you go via character just to make sure that factors do not mess up with it so very common idiom, apply to part of the matrix, to the columns, a function of X, and then as numeric, as character X, to take X, go via character, and then make it a numeric value. Sometimes you want to match the input parameters to a list of allowed parameters. So when you are writing your own function right, um, it might be that you have a function which is called example, it takes something called X as input, be it a matrix, be it a list or a vector or whatever, but it also has a method, right? So for example, you have developed a new algorithm and this algorithm can use three different methods. For example, it can use principal components, it can use uh, correlation, or it can use covariance, right? And the user specifies which one of these three it wants. Of course, the user, because you are giving the user the function in a package or something like that, the user, of course, can fill out, fill in anything. He doesn't have to fill in your exact thing, right? It could say, well, I support uh, PCA, um, but the user says uh, use PTA, right? They make a typo. So to prevent this and to, to notify the user that he can only choose from a very limited amount of methods, um, you can say something like this, where you say, well, I define a new variable called supported, which are all of the different methodologies that are supported. In my case, the method parameter can be either A, B, or C, capitalized, not anything else. Then what I do is I do a P match. So I match the method that the user inputted to the function, to the supported functions. And now if, I, if this variable is not NA, 
then I have a valid method. So then the user chose one of the methods which are supported. If it is an A, then you can just throw a stop error and say that the method that the user has chosen is not supported because he didn't fill in A, B, or C. He probably filled in D or made some typo. Um, but this is very useful when you are writing code that you want other people to use. Um, and hey, you just have a very limited of thing or limited set of things that the user can use. Um, then you can then you can use the pmatch function to partially match the method that the user selected with a list of supported methods. And hey, if if an A is returned, then you know that the user selected something which is not not in the list. If the user selected something which is in the list, then method will be the thing that the user selected. Very useful for writing functions when you ever start writing functions for your own packages and publishing your code so that other people can use them. Another very common idiom is when you write a function and your function returns something, then the return value of a function is just scrolled across the screen. Right, because the same thing when I type the name of a variable, it will just start rolling the thing across the screen. Often, a lot of functions, they have a massive return, right? In, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm just making a little example function. It takes a number as input. And the only thing that this does is that it repeats this thing, what the user inputted, like a million of times. So if I would just call example one, and I would not have put invisible around it, then this would have printed a million ones. So it would just fill up the whole R window with one, 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 one. And that's just really, really annoying. So if you write functions for other people, use the invisible keyword. What happens is, is when you type example one, it will not start rolling a million ones across the screen. It will just kind of eat the output. It will still generate the output. You can still put the output in a variable like this. And when you type the name of the variable, you still see a million ones. But at least when you call the function and you forget to put the result in a variable, it will not start scrolling everything across the screen, um, which is really, really annoying. Um, and uh, using invisible prevents this massive amount of output spam from a function just because I forgot to store the result in a variable. All right, I wanted to have a little bit of a different kind of common idiom, which is something that you will use a lot. Um, and I want to show you how you can do R scripts from the command line. So we already use the command line when we build our own package. Um, yeah, so you then do R CMD check name of your package um, in the in the command line. Um, but you can use R via the command line. And using R via the command line has certain massive advantages. One of the advantages is, is that you can then run your scripts on an external server or on an external cluster um, using things like um, Secure Shell. So you, you're not limited to only using your own computer. Hey, you can write a script. You can then copy the script to a, a remote server or to a remote cluster and then hey, copy the data there as well. And then you can run your script there directly via the command line. Um, and it, this helps you to um, use external hardware um, in case that you don't have the hardware that you need at home. And if I do sequencing analysis, then I have to use our, our server because the laptop that I'm using is not going to be good enough. So the thing, what you do is you make your whole analysis in a script. So a single text document, which starts off by setting the working directory, then loading up the input files. Um, but of course, because it is a script, it might be that the input files or that you, that you wanna run it like five times because I have five different input files or I have three different input files or a hundred, right? So I write the script and then I, then I just assume that the name of the input file is going to be in a variable. So that's the way that I write it. So I just define an empty variable um, or at the beginning of my script saying, this is the name of the file that I need to load in and do the analysis on. So to be able to then fill in this kind of magical variable, which file do I need to do the analysis on? You can then use command line parameters. 
So we'll see an example about this soon. The only thing that I want to kind of make sure that when you start writing scripts, so an analysis script, which you are going to run via the command line, you need to always end with a quit no at the end, because otherwise it will run through all the commands that you did. It will reach the end of the script and it will just stay there because it has no, it, it won't quit R automatically. So you as a user have to tell R to quit at the end of the script. So, hey, you write your whole script. So you load in your file, you do your analysis, you write your output, and then the last line of the script ends in a quit statement. So using the Q function to quit, and then this function needs to know if it needs to save the workspace. So we never save the workspace. So we just say quit and then no. And this is very important because otherwise the script will just run, it will write your output file and then it will just hang there. So it will just not continue because it didn't get any order to quit down. So it's still waiting for input, but no input will ever come. Um, and of course, if you are on a server where other people are also working, it's not really nice to leave programs running for weeks on end before killing them. So how do you do this? So create a new file and I always put kind of the following code inside. So the first code, the first line of code uses the command args function. So command args are the command line arguments that were provided to the script. And here I first check if I get at least one command line argument back. Because if I don't get any arguments, then I do not know what, for example, the name is of the file that I have to start analyzing, right? So I always want at least one argument to my script. And if this is not the case, I have to quit, right? Always quit the script as soon as possible because otherwise R will just continue there and it will just do a stop error, but it will never quit the R session. So make sure that you quit your script when there is an error. So I can use command args, and then I get a new variable called command line arguments, and I assign it to it. If the length of this thing is more than one, then I'm just going to select the first one. I'm going to say as character, and then this is my arc one. So this is my first argument that was given to the script. And generally the first argument that you want to give to the script is the name of the file that you're going to analyze, right? So then I would have here uh, normally a read table arg1 um, or read comma separated file arg1 and then call that my data. And then the rest of the script would just be analyzing m data, calculating some statistics and then writing it out. Um, here, I'm just going to write the argument to the screen and then I'm going to quit the script because that's what I should do. I cannot leave R running just because I don't want to quit it at this point. So then I open up the terminal, right? And I go, for example, to where I have stored my script. And then the thing that I'm doing is just saying R script, my, R, my script .r. So this is the R file that I just created. And then here I give the parameter. So in this case, I just say something, but this would normally be, um, for example, dataset1.txt. And then the next time that you're going to call it, you're going to call our script, my script, dataset2.csv, right? And in this way, I can have R running in parallel on the same server like 20 times, and every time the same script analyzes a slightly different file. So, for example, if I think about mice, um, have mice have 20 chromosomes, so I might have a script which analyzes a single chromosome, and I just call this script 20 times on the server, every time saying, our script, my script that I want to execute, chromosome1.txt, my script, chromosome2.txt, right? And then it will just start up the script. And even if it's, the script runs for like an hour or two, um, it will just do all 20 of them in parallel. So instead of waiting 20 times two hours, I now wait only two hours in total because it does 20 uh, chromosomes next to each other automatically. So move where your script is stored using CD, so change directory. And then you can execute your script by just typing our script 
the name of the script that you created, and then the name of the thing that you want to analyze. And generally, the name of the thing that you want to analyze is something like mydata1.txt or chromosome1.vcf or just the input file. So that, that's a very common structure on how to use the command line to run R multiple times next to each other um, so that instead of having to do it in a for loop, yeah, you can do chromosome 1, chromosome 2, and chromosome 3 next to each other in parallel and be done three times as fast as if you would go in a for loop one after another. Of course, when we are dealing with building up these command line scripts, we also want to execute external programs, or a lot of the time we need to ex execute external programs. For example, a whole bunch of next generation sequencing tools um, are not available for R. They are available as command line tools. The same thing holds when you think about GWAS programs. Um, a lot of GWAS programs are only available as standalone executables, for example, Plink, um, or other tools. Um, you, you have a massive amount of tools which are not available directly in R, but available via the command line. Um, and so, for example, next generation sequencing data, um, and generally there's a lot of different tools involved. So you need an aligner, you need like things to check data, you need to convert. And, and so there's a whole bunch of steps that need to go in order. Um, and every time you need to use an external program to do that. The same thing when you're analyzing image files. Hey, for example, if you have microarray data and had the microarray data, you didn't get the cell files, but you got the original kind of TIFF files. And then you have to go through all of the different photos of the different microarrays and for each of these extract the data from uh, the microarray and put it in a csv file and, and there's a lot of command line tools which are not directly available in r so something like blast or uh, cluster omega or the variant effect predictor and, and there's literally hundreds and hundreds of tools which are available which you can only run via the command line so how do you do that in R? Well, this is something that I always use. So this is my execute function. And the execute function is nothing more than a wrapper around the function called system. So the main workhorse here is the system function. But I always want to have additional um, safeguards in a way, because the system doesn't automatically quit when there is an error. And I do want to quit because often when I'm running a pipeline, I call different tools. But if any of these tools fail, I also want to stop doing my pipeline, right? Because if the aligner fails and doesn't align the sequencing reads to the genome, it makes no sense to continue with the next step. So I have my execute function. It gets a parameter called X, which is the, the, a, a character string that it's going to execute. It has a function, uh, a parameter called intern. So this means, does R need to load the data or the output of the program back into R? And generally, that's not the case. So the default value is false. Um, and I have an additional parameter called quit on error. And that is true, because I do want to quit when the error occurs, because of the fact that otherwise R will just continuously hang there. Or worse, it will continue with the next step without having done the current step or with an error on the current step. So what do I do? Well, I first do a couple of prints. So I print out the command that I'm going to execute. Then I'm using the system function to execute this command, specifying if I want to get back the output from the program or not. So generally, I don't want the output from the program back. So if I'm not in turn, I print the result. Right, because I want to know if the program finishes, yes or no. So if this is a zero, the program finished successfully. If this is not a zero, an error has occurred. So if I'm not in turn and I and a zero had occurred, and it's not a zero, right? So somewhere an error occurred, and I have a quit on error, then I just quit. Otherwise, I just return the result invisibly, just to prevent spamming. So, for example, I can now use it to do a dir command, right? So normally, if I would go to the command line and I would just type in dir, it would list all of the files in the current working directory. So I can do the same thing now from R. So I can say execute dir. This will not show me anything because of the invisible. However, when I execute dir and say 
don't do, uh, do it internally. So so give me back the thing that it, that it tells me. Um, then I can now store it in a variable. But often I use it like this. So I can hey, often I just call. I use the execute function to, for example, go through a list of files and then execute the R script, my script, with an additional parameter. So hey, this will 10 times call an external program. The external program that I'm calling in this case is R. So I'm having an R script calling R externally, specifying that this external R script needs to run my script.R. And then the input parameter is X, which in this case is one, the second time. Yeah, so this will, in very quick succession, just fire up 10 R instances, and every instance will be able to analyze their own part of the data. So this is this is something that I use very, very, very much. I use this a lot to execute external programs like BLAST or the VEP or other tools in biology where there's no direct R equivalent of the tool. So you have to use the command line um, to execute other tools that do support the function that you want. All right, so that was it for today. So today we talked a little bit about common idioms, like how do I use LApply, um, grep, gsub, executing external commands. Uh, we talked about logistic regression and about GLMs, which is just the same as doing an LM, but where the response variable is different. So for example, a binary outcome saying healthy or sick um, or affected, unaffected. Um, and besides that, hey, of course, the GLM model allows you to use a lot of different, um, a lot of different distributions. Hey, so it doesn't have to be just binomial. It can also be like a Poisson distribution or quasi Poisson. So hey, R supports, I think, around 12 different distributions. Um, some of these distributions you can even tweak. Hey, you can give additional parameters saying, well, it's a Gaussian distribution, but it's a little bit platy or it's a little bit lepto um, yeah, So it's a little bit stretched out or it's a little bit squeezed. Um, and that will give you more power to detect effects. And of course, when, you, when you're when you predicting a non-normal, not continuous variable, and then of course you have to specify the correct link function, so the correct family um, for R to know how to analyze your data. All right, so that's it for the new stuff for today and actually for the whole lecture, I think. We will have fishy data next week, but there won't be any really new stuff because I'm just going to use all of the things that we've been talking about for the last 11 lectures to analyze the fishy data. Although I am using 3D matrices in the fishy data. So that might be interesting for next week for you guys to show how you can use uh, more than two dimensions. Like normally when you think about a matrix, then you think about having a two dimensional structure, which having rows and columns. Um, but in R, you can also make three dimensional or four dimensional matrices. Um, so a three dimensional matrix would be a cube where you have like a depth, a width and a, and a, a third dimension. Um, but you can also make four dimensional cubes um, and helps a lot when you want to kind of get a handle on data which has many different dimensions um, and hey you don't want to write for every dimension the same function um, but that's about it so that was more or less the course um, i will do a short break and after the break i will go through all of the lectures one by one and highlight what i think is important so that you guys can uh, study more um, target it for the exam. All right, so then see you guys in seven, eight minutes. So we'll continue at 4 p.m., 4.05 p.m. And um, if there's no questions so far, then we'll go to the second break, which should be goats, I think, again. I think we already did go goats recently, but I just like the animated gifs. All right, so then see you guys in like 10 minutes and enjoy the animated gifts.